I belong to a, a choir in Totnes, and uh, it's quite a good choir, but the last time I went to rehearsal, our choir mistress said, you're a great choir, but you don't smile enough. So I'll, I'll just try and smiling and cheer you all up. Um, oops. I came across this, uh, this folder in my cupboard recently. Uh, I got it at the EU Commission in the 80s at a conference, and uh, it's got these stars on it and everything. I just wondered whether it would be confiscated or it would be a <laughs> or, um, collector's item. I don't know. OK. So. So it's been, a, it's been a long conference, as we know, um, and you're probably tired listening to people. Um, so if you remember nothing else from my uh, contribution, it may be the question I've been asking myself for the past 30 years, which is, which is this. Um, is the education we're providing appropriate to and sufficient for the kind of world we're living in and the kind of world that graduates are entering? Just that. And if you think the answer is yes, why? And if you think the answer is no, why? Um, now, I'll just leave that for a moment and go on. But I, we, were asked to, uh, as we were asked to look at the global picture and then sort of focus in on, on the local in our presentation. So I'm going to do the same as uh, other contributors. So this is the structure of my talk, if you like. So there's four sections, the contextual on the top, top left, uh, contextual challenge, and then secondly, what's happening internationally as regards how education's role is seen in the global sustainability debate. Thirdly, movements within education, which can be seen as responding to these challenges. Then fourth, what are we doing at Plymouth, uh, which as the right hand arrow indicates, hopefully is making or potentially making some positive contribution to the global challenges we've been hearing today and yesterday. So, very quickly, something about uh, global context. I don't have to say much about that because it's been covered pretty well. Uh, you, you might have seen in one of, one of Valor's slides uh, this diagram on the right-hand side from uh, the Stockholm Resilience Center, uh, a team led by Johan Rockström, who, and they suggested there a framework of nine uh, what they called planetary boundaries, which they described as safe, a safe operating space for humanity necessary to any development that purports to be sustainable. So these trends uh, mark a shift from, if you like, the age of the Holocene, which started some 10,000 years ago, to the current age, which, as I'm sure you will know, some have called the Anthropocene, um, which, whereby humans are seen as the main agents of uh, change in Earth systems. So this idea raises for me the intriguing notion of maybe we need Anthropocenic education. Um, Rockstrom and his colleagues' work was published in uh, 2009, and there have been update papers since then. And uh, this one I'm going to show now, just a quote from, uh, came out last year. And um, so he talks about uh, a two pronged strategy. So the first one is acting within our current obsolete development framework to bend environmental and social justice curves as much as possible. But interestingly, secondly, he says, while simultaneously fostering this long-term shift in consciousness to values and institutions that equitably integrate people and planet. So this idea of a uh, great transition, you'll see great transition initiative on the top right there. Um, it's quite an old idea. In fact, uh, um, I think Valor mentioned Kenneth Boulding. He, he first uh, advanced this idea in the 60s. Um, a transition to a, a more ecological and uh, sustainable postmodern era uh, is the is the aspiration, if you like. But the detail of what this means and implies is is really, you know, it's in infancy in some ways. Um, but his his two pronged strategy raises the whole question of the purpose of education, education policy, and practice for me. Um, because I think any chance of a great transition depends on the quality and depth of collective social learning over the next decade or two. I think its first prong there is quite rep represented by the UN Sustainable Development Goals, which I'm sure you will know were launched in September last year uh, by the United Nations after a long period of consultation and uh, supersede the Millennium Development Goals. Um, they look like that. Steve God Goodhue uh, referred to one of them this morning. Um, 17 sustainable development goals, 169 targets. Uh, and the UN sees them as, and I quote, a supremely ambitious and transformational vision. 
And it also says that the UN will work tirelessly for the full implementation of this agenda by 2030. That's 15 years, 15 years only. Um, so these 17 goals form a, a further challenge to and a mandate for uh, sustainability education, in my view. Goal four, you, you'll see, is quality education, a goal for education. However, it's very aligned to uh, universal, universal access to education rather than being particularly aligned to uh, sustainability. Um, last, yeah, last, uh, last year, I was invited to be part of an international team of uh, some 40 people from around the world from 21 different countries brought together by the International Council for Science to work on an independent review of the SDGs, the, the goals. Uh, and it was my privilege to write the Goal 4 review. And uh, my two key points were these. One is that uh, Goal 4, no, the goals as a whole did not really recognize the importance of education as an a, as a agent of change, not really. And secondly, Goal 4 in particular underplays the role of education vis-a-vis -vis sustainable development and environmental quality. And only one target of the 10 under goal four actually mentions sustainability, strangely enough. Um, although I, I wasn't terribly surprised by this because some, some other work I did for UNESCO the year before, um, I looked at a lot of the high level documents around this agenda and, uh, and almost all of them underplay the role of education in, in meeting uh, these challenges, uh, which you might, I think is rather strange. In the meantime, however, meantime, however, uh, UNESCO is banging the drum quite loudly on in, on education and really uh, encouraging all stakeholders to um, up their game, really, on, on on these issues. Excuse me for a second. So. We have this notion of ESD, which stands for Education for Sustainable Development. I don't particularly like the term, but it's, it's, it has currency. And uh, UNESCO um, launched this, what they call the Global Action Program. Um, and that's the aspiration, if you like. Um, that's what they think edu education should be doing. Um, but having said that, the UNESCO is well aware of the challenge this, this, this uh, poses to a lot of uh, mainstream uh, thinking about education purposes and policy. But it's not new. I mean, this call has been going out since 1992 with the, with the Rio summit um, and, and well before that. The other interesting thing uh, is UNESCO is saying, you know, bold change is needed. And their own rhetoric has got more bolder, I think, over the last 10 years. So look at this quote. More than, the alignment, more than the alignment or scaling up of existing good practice will be needed with greater attention to systemic approaches to curriculum change and capacity building for leaders. So it's not just about a, a little bit of an infusion of sustainability, sustainability content here and there, changing teaching methods here and there, but actually a rethinking of the kind of education which is appropriate to our times. Uh, they backed that up with a, a book came out last year, uh, Rethinking Education with the intriguing uh, subtitle towards a, a global common good, um, as opposed to a private good, which is, of course, a current and powerful trend. And uh, this is the, a quote from the foreword by the uh, Director General, Irina Bukova. Now, more positively, um, with this challenge in place, uh, they launched a couple of years ago um, with money from the Japanese government, the UNESCO Japan Prize on Education for Sustainable Development. And I've been privileged to be a member of the international jury looking at the submissions on this. And I, I know to my cost, like this last week, uh, I've gone through 120 submissions from all over the country, uh, sorry, all over the globe, I should say. Um, for high quality submissions from projects, groups, institutions from all over the world in the formal and non-formal sectors. And what I'm reading there, uh, and for virtually every country you can think of, uh, is a heartening level of energy, commitment, inventiveness, determination to empower people, particularly young people, to make a positive difference to their, their localities and spheres of influence. So, you know, I, although it's a lot of work, I'm, I'm extremely encouraged by the amount of stuff that's going on at, at, at all levels. Um, very positive. Um, the three project criteria is that they should be integrative, projects should be integrative, bring together the economic, social and economic dimensions. They should be innovative and they should be transformative in effect. 
Now these, uh, the groundswell, if you like, represented by these submissions reflects and parallels a growing international debate on what kind of competences we need to be um, developing and encouraging through educational practice and policy. So I just want to move uh, on to that. Um, th this slide just represents um, the kind of discussion that's been going on for at least the last six or seven years. Um, you, you'll see a lot of versions of these kind of ideas um, which are in the, in the debate and discourse at the moment. Um, here at Plymouth, we've had pretty strong embedding of sustainability across the curriculum with some, some outstanding specialist courses around sustainability topics and inclusion of sustainability across at least 50% uh, of our programmes. But whether we sufficiently address such competencies and skills which appear here is, is still a moot point um, and to be pursued, I think. Um, and I, for me, I think it comes down to how we see the purpose of education. I mean, certainly, you know, the big words are employability and internationalization, which are important, but also, I think, uh, the ability to manage and flourish in socioeconomic and environmental conditions of increasing uncertainty, flux, and complexity are also incredibly important, and given the news today, even more important in terms of coping with uncertainty. So uh, what, we, what we're doing at Plymouth is uh, one thing, at least, is we produced a thing uh, called the Plymouth University Compass. It's still in early stages. Um, it's being launched as a, uh, a framework of graduate attributes, which we hope will help students and staff grapple with these, some, of, some of these positive um, qualities which we hope uh, graduates will emerge with. It's not compulsory, it's advisory set of guidelines that won't be launched till September next year. Uh, in the meantime, a lot of work is underway to, to uh, develop web pages and staff and student support material. There are four dimensions which you can see there. You read, read for yourselves. And uh, the next slide is far too small in terms of writing, don't worry about it, but there's the four. Uh, the main part of putting that up is you've got the four um, key areas, which are then broken down into subgroups, if you like. So if we take the top one, uh, top right, sustainable and global citizenship, um, five qualities there are sustainability awareness, we've changed the, the, the title there from literacy, uh, systems thinking, openness to other cultural perspectives, social and environmental responsibility, and change leadership. And I think this is a, a really nice piece of work which the students have been involved in developing, and I think it's pretty special. We, we've looked at uh, this kind of work in other parts of the country. And, uh, and internationally, and I think ours is, is, you know, goes a little further, let's say. I'm going to finish with uh, just mentioning a few um, of the research projects we're involved in, and just confusingly for those of you who are outside the university, and even confusingly for those of you who are inside the university. Um, uh, my bit of the work doesn't actually come under the SEI umbrella as such, but uh, another uh, research Institute here, which is called PEDRIO, the Pedagogical Research Institute. But what's great about the, the situation here at Plymouth is that you know, there's close links between uh, the pedagogical research and the sustainability research. So this is some of the, um, some of the ESD research projects uh, which are happening at uh, the moment. Um, and uh, I should say that uh, there's a lot of people involved in this, and uh, I think taking everybody uh, who are, is working on these projects. Um, it, we form quite w one of the biggest groups in the country, I think, who are interested in pedagogical, uh, pedagogical research around uh, sustainability topics. And, when, and also, we've got quite an archive of published research going back some years. Um, so these particular projects are, c are quite small scale, but uh, they're important in investigating the methods and approaches that help ensure the education we're engaging in with students really does match up to and adjust the sorts of challenges that's uh, been the topic of this uh, conference. And one more slide on projects. And uh, I've got shown the people's names who are involved in these projects. Um, we're also very much in touch with other uh, similar uh, groupings, nationally and internationally. We're well connected, and, uh, and this work is, is going ahead. Uh, we've also, part of that is uh, we organized a conference here called Sustainability in Higher Education. Um, last year, and now we've got a series of conferences which is being sort of placed around different parts of the country. The next one is in a couple of weeks' time, July the 7th in K 
Canterbury Christchurch. So this movement started here at Plymouth. So I'm talking here about educational, educational research looking at sustainability, but the flip chart of that is, is the SEI sustainability research looking at educational application, and a lot of it does. Uh, so how can that um, affect and infuse the teaching and learning offered here at Plymouth? Um, uh, one, one part of, the, uh, one of the features, if you like, of what we try to do here at Plymouth is bring together operations, research, and teaching and learning, you know, quite successfully, I think. And one of the SEI um, initiatives was, was to look at uh, some of the campus operations uh, issues here and offer those topics to students and staff, for that matter, to, to be part of their research. So it's really good to, to get this sort of integrated approach to, to these topics, even within our own uh, campus and estates. So uh, finishing off, I think that's my last slide, um, we're fortunate to have here a, a large pool of interested and committed staff and indeed students compared to some other universities. For example, uh, the NUS, the National Union of Students and the Higher Education Academy has had a survey going on for the past four years looking at student attitudes to sustainable development and Plymouth students uh, over all that time have form, formed the largest percentage of uh, students responding to the survey, which is, you know, I think significant. We've consistently topped the people in Planet League, Green League, so, you know, th this is good. Um, but going back to where I started, if you like, and uh, in looking at Camille's and Valer's presentations and others, I think these issues and the SDGs present a, a massive challenge to the purposes and practices of, of higher education. And particularly the second prong of Rockstrom's two-prong strategy, if you remember, which is uh, calling for a longer-term sh shift in consciousness to values and institutions. But here at Plymouth, at least I'm confident about uh, and optimistic about our trajectory. And I think there's a real uh, opportunity here to further recognise, for the university to further recognise the extraordinarily strong platform it's built over the past 10 years plus, uh, across research, across uh, teaching and learning, across campus operations, and to go to another level uh, to, lo to show uh, leadership uh, and energy in, in the sector. Okay, thank you for your attention.